Aztec, Wikipedia article audio. Aztec culture, also known as Mexica culture, was a Mesoamerican culture that flourished in central Mexico in the post-classic period from 1300 to 1521 during the time in which a triple alliance of the Mexica, Texcoca, and Tepanica tribes established the Aztec Empire. The Aztec people were certain ethnic groups of central Mexico, particularly those groups who spoke the Nahuatl language and who dominated large parts of Mesoamerica from the 14th to the 16th centuries. Aztec culture is the culture of the people referred to as Aztecs, but since most ethnic groups of central Mexico in the post-classic period shared basic cultural traits, many of the traits that characterize Aztec culture cannot be said to be exclusive to the Aztecs. For the same reason, the notion of Aztec civilization is best understood as a particular horizon of a general Mesoamerican civilization. The culture of central Mexico includes maize cultivation, the social division between Papilton nobility and Mace Holton commoners, a pantheon, and the calendric system of Azaiha Pahuali of 365 days intercalated with a Tonal Pahuali of 260 days. Particular to the Aztecs of Tenochtitlan was the Mexica patron god Hutzilapochtli, twin pyramids, and the ceramic ware known as Aztec I to III. Definitions History From the 13th century, the Valley of Mexico was the heart of Aztec civilization, there the city of Tenochtitlan, the capital of the Aztec Triple Alliance, was built upon raised islets in Lake Texcoco. The Triple Alliance formed the Aztec Empire, a tributary empire that expanded its political hegemony far beyond the Valley of Mexico conquering other city-states throughout Mesoamerica in the late post-classic period. It originated in 1427 as an alliance between the city-states Tenochtitlan, Texcoco, and Tlacopan, these allied to defeat the Tepanic state of Azhke Potzalco, which had previously dominated the basin of Mexico. Soon Texcoco and Tlacopan became junior partners in the alliance, of which the Mexica of Tenochtitlan were the de facto leaders. The empire extended its power by a combination of trade and military conquest. It was never a true territorial empire controlling a territory by large military garrisons in conquered provinces, but rather controlled its client states primarily by installing friendly rulers in conquered cities by constructing marriage alliances between the ruling dynasties, and by extending an imperial ideology to its client states. Client states paid tribute to the Aztec emperor, the Huey Tlaidoani, in an economic strategy limiting communication and trade between outlying polities, making them dependent on the imperial center for the acquisition of luxury goods. The political clout of the empire reached far south into Mesoamerica conquering cities as far south as Chiapas and Guatemala and spanning from the Pacific to the Atlantic Oceans. The empire reached its maximal extent in 1519, just prior to the arrival of the Spanish conquistadors led by Hernán Cortés who managed to topple the Aztec Empire by allying with some of the traditional enemies of the Aztecs, the Nahuatl-speaking Tlaxcalteca. Subsequently, the Spanish founded the new settlement of Mexico City on the site of the ruined Aztec capital, from where they proceeded with the process of colonizing Central America. Aztec culture and history is primarily known through archaeological evidence found in excavations such as that of the renowned Templo Mayor in Mexico City, from indigenous bark paper codices, from eyewitness accounts by Spanish conquistadors such as Cortés and Bernal Díaz del Castillo, 
and especially from 16th and 17th century descriptions of Aztec culture and history written by Spanish clergymen and literate Aztecs in the Spanish or Nahuatl language, such as the famous Florentine Codex compiled by the Franciscan monk Bernardino de Sehagan with the help of indigenous Aztec informants. At its height, Aztec culture had rich and complex mythological and religious traditions, as well as achieving remarkable architectural and artistic accomplishments. The Nahuatl words Aztecatl and Azteca mean people from Aztlan, a mythological place for the Nahuatl-speaking culture of the time, and later adopted as the word to define the Mexica people. Often the term Aztec refers exclusively to the Mexica people of Tenochtitlan, situated on an island in Lake Texcoco, who referred to themselves as Mexica Tenaca or Clahuaja Mexica. Sometimes the term also includes the inhabitants of Tenochtitlan's two principal allied city-states, the Acolhuas of Texcoco and the Tepanex of Tlacapan, who together with the Mexica formed the Aztec Triple Alliance that controlled what is often known as the Aztec Empire. In other contexts, Aztec may refer to all the various city-states and their peoples, who shared large parts of their ethnic history and cultural traits with the Mexica, Acolhua, and Tepanex and who often also used the Nahuatl language as a lingua franca. In this meaning, it is possible to talk about an Aztec civilization including all the particular cultural patterns common for most of the peoples inhabiting central Mexico in the late post-classic period. When used to describe ethnic groups, the term Aztec refers to several Nahuatl-speaking peoples of central Mexico in the post-classic period of Mesoamerican chronology, especially the Mexica, the ethnic group that had a leading role in establishing the hegemonic empire based at Tenochtitlan. The term extends to further ethnic groups associated with the Aztec Empire such as the Acolhua, the Tepanec, and others that were incorporated into the empire. In older usage the term was commonly used about modern Nahuatl-speaking ethnic groups, as Nahuatl was previously referred to as the Aztec language. In recent usage, these ethnic groups are referred to as the Nahua peoples. Linguistically, the term Aztecan is still used about the branch of the uto aztecan languages that includes the Nahuatl language and its closest relatives Pochotec and Papil. Central Mexico in the Classic and Post-Classic To the Aztecs themselves the word Aztec was not an endonym for any particular ethnic group. Rather, it was an umbrella term used to refer to several ethnic groups, not all of them Nahuatl-speaking, that claimed heritage from the mythic place of origin, Aztlan. In the Nahuatl language Aztecatl means person from Aztlan. Alexander von Humboldt originated the modern usage of Aztec in 1810, as a collective term applied to all the people linked by trade, custom, religion, and language to the Mexica state and the Triple Alliance. In 1843, with the publication of the work of William H. Prescott, the term was adopted by most of the world including 19th-century Mexican scholars who saw it as a way to distinguish present-day Mexicans from pre-conquest Mexicans. This usage has been the subject of debate in more recent years, but the term Aztec is still more common. It is a matter of debate whether the enormous city of Teotihuacan was inhabited by speakers of Nahuatl, or whether Nahuas had not yet arrived in central Mexico in the Classic period. It is generally agreed that the Nahua peoples were not indigenous to the highlands of central Mexico, but that they gradually migrated into the region from somewhere in northwestern Mexico. At the fall of Teotihuacan in the 6th century CE, a number of city-states rose to power in central Mexico, some of them, including Cholula and Cochicalco, 
probably inhabited by Nahuatl speakers. One study has suggested that Nahuas originally inhabited the Baggio area around Guanajuato which reached a population peak in the 6th century, after which the population quickly diminished during a subsequent dry period. This depopulation of the Baggio coincided with an incursion of new populations into the Valley of Mexico, which suggests that this marks the influx of Nahuatl speakers into the region. These populated central Mexico, dislocating speakers of Otomanguine languages as they spread their political influence south. As the former nomadic hunter-gatherer peoples mixed with the complex civilizations of Mesoamerica, adopting religious and cultural practices, the foundation for later Aztec culture was laid. After 900 CE, during the post-classic period, a number of sites almost certainly inhabited by Nahuatl speakers became powerful. Among them the site of Tula, Hidalgo, and also city-states such as Tinayuca, and Calhuacan in the Valley of Mexico and Cuauhnawak in Morelos. Migrational Period and Foundation of Tenochtitlan In the ethno-historical sources from the colonial-colonial period, Aztecs themselves describe their arrival in the Valley of Mexico. The ethnonym Aztec means people from Aztlan, Aztlan being a mythical place of origin toward the north. Hence the term applied to all those peoples who claimed to carry the heritage from this mythical place. The migration stories of the Mexica tribe tell how they traveled with other tribes, including the Tlaxcalteca, Tepanica, and Acolhua, but that eventually their tribal deity Hutzilopochtli told them to split from the other Aztec tribes and take on the name Mexica. At the time of their arrival, there were many Aztec city-states in the region. The most powerful were Calhuacan to the south and Ajke Potzalco to the west. The Tepanecs of Ajk Potzalco soon expelled the Mexicas from Chapultepec. In 1299, Calhuacan ruler Cocaxli gave them permission to settle in the empty barrens of Tizapan, where they were eventually assimilated into Calhuacan culture. The noble lineage of Calhuacan traced its roots back to the legendary city state of Tula, and by marrying into Calhua families, the Mexica now also adopted this heritage. After living in Calhuacan, the Mexica were again expelled and moved on. According to Aztec legend, in 1323 the Mexicas were shown a vision of an eagle perched on a prickly pear cactus, eating a snake. The vision indicated the location where they were to build their home. The Mexica founded the town of Tenochtitlan on a small swampy island in Lake Texcoco. The year of foundation is usually given as 1325. In 1376 the Mexica royal dynasty was founded when Acomapictli, son of a Mexica father and a Calhua mother, was elected as the first Huey Plato-Ani of Tenochtitlan. In the first 50 years after the founding of the Mexica dynasty, the Mexica were a tributary of Ajk Potzalco, which had become a major regional power under the ruler Tizazamuk. The Mexica supplied the Tepanica with warriors for their successful conquest campaigns in the region and received part of the tribute from the conquered city-states. In this way, the prestige and economy of Tenochtitlan gradually grew. In 1396, at Acomapictli's death, his son Hutzilahutl became ruler, married to Tizazamuk's daughter, the relation with Ajk Potzalco remained close. Chimalpapoca, son of Hutzilahutl, became ruler of Tenochtitlan in 1417. In 1418, Ajk Potzalco initiated a war against the Acolhua of Texcoco and killed their ruler Islilxocatl. 
Even though Islilxocatl was married to Kemal Papaka's daughter, the Mexica ruler continued to support Tizazamuk. Tizazamuk died in 1426, and his sons began a struggle for rulership of Ajk Potsalco. During this struggle for power, Chimal Papoka died, probably killed by Tizazamuk's son Maxtla who saw him as a competitor. Early Rulers Izakotl, brother of Hutzilahutl and uncle of Chimal Papoka, was elected the next Mexica Tlatoani. The Mexica were now in open war with Ajk Potsalco and Izakotl petitioned for an alliance with Nezawalcoyotl, son of the slain Texcocan ruler Islilxocatl against Maxtla. Izakotl also allied with Maxtla's brother Toto Kihuistli ruler of the Tepanic city of Tlacapan. The Triple Alliance of Tenochtitlan, Texcoco, and Tlacapan besieged Ajk Potsalco, and in 1428 they destroyed the city and sacrificed Maxtla. Through this victory Tenochtitlan became the dominant city-state in the Valley of Mexico, and the alliance between the three cities provided the basis on which the Aztec Empire was built. Imperial Expansion Izacotl proceeded by securing a power basis for Tenochtitlan, by conquering the city-states on the southern lake including Calhuacan, Xochimilco, Quitlahuac, and Mizcaic. These states had an economy based on highly productive Chinampa agriculture, cultivating floating gardens in the shallow lake Xochimilco. Izacotl then undertook further conquests in the valley of Morelos, subjecting the city-state of Kuahunawak. Motikutsoma i Ilhuicamina In 1440, Motikutsoma i Ilhuicamina was elected Tlatoani, he was son of Hutzilahutl, brother of Chimal Papoka and had served as the war leader of his uncle Izakotl in the war against the Tepanaks. The accession of a new ruler in the dominant city-state was often an occasion for subjected cities to rebel by refusing to pay tribute. This meant that new rulers began their rule with a coronation campaign, often against rebellious tributaries but also sometimes demonstrating their military might by making new conquests. Motikutsoma tested the attitudes of the cities around the valley by requesting laborers for the enlargement of the great temple of Tenochtitlan. Only the city of Chalco refused to provide laborers, and hostilities between Chalco and Tenochtitlan would persist until the 1450s. Motikutsoma then reconquered the cities in the valley of Morelos and Guerrero, and then later undertook new conquests in the Huaxtec region of northern Veracruz, and the Mixtec region of Coyotlahuaca and large parts of Oaxaca, and later again in central and southern Veracruz with conquests at Cosamalapan, Awalizapan, and Cutlaxtlan. During this period the city-states of Tlaxcalan, Cholula, and Huxotzinco emerged as major competitors to the imperial expansion, and they supplied warriors to several of the cities conquered. Motikutsoma therefore initiated a state of low-intensity warfare against these three cities, staging minor skirmishes called flower wars against them, perhaps as a strategy of exhaustion. Motikutsoma also consolidated the political structure of the Triple Alliance, and the internal political organization of Tenochtitlan. His brother Tlaisillel served as his main advisor and he is considered the architect of major political reforms in this period, consolidating the power of the noble class and instituting a set of legal codes and the practice of reinstating conquered rulers in their cities bound by fealty to the Mexica Tlatoani. Axiacatl and Tizoc In 1469, the next ruler became Axiacatl, son of Izacotl's son Tizazamak and Motikutsoma I's daughter Atatistli. 
he undertook a successful coronation campaign far south of Tenochtitlan against the Zapotecs in the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. Axayacatl also conquered the independent Mexica city of Tlatlalco, located on the northern part of the island where Tenochtitlan was also located. The Tlatlalcar ruler Makihuix was married to Axayacatl's sister, and his alleged mistreatment of her was used as an excuse to incorporate Tlatlalco and its important market directly under the control of the Tlatoani of Tenochtitlan. Axayacatl then conquered areas in central Guerrero, the Puebla Valley, on the Gulf Coast and against the Otomi and Matlatzinxa in the Toluca Valley. The Toluca Valley was a buffer zone against the powerful Tarascan state in Michoacan, against which Axayacatl turned next. In the major campaign against the Tarascans in 1478-79 the Aztec forces were repelled by a well-organized defense. Axayacatl was soundly defeated in a battle at Tlaximaloyan, losing most of his 32,000 men and only barely escaping back to Tenochtitlan with the remnants of his army. In 1481 at Axayacatl's death, his older brother Tizoc was elected ruler. Tizoc's coronation campaign against the Otomi of Metztitlan failed as he lost the major battle and only managed to secure 40 prisoners to be sacrificed for his coronation ceremony. Having shown weakness, many of the tributary towns rebelled and consequently most of Tizoc's short reign was spent attempting to quell rebellions and maintain control of areas conquered by his predecessors. Tizoc died suddenly in 1485, and it has been suggested that he was poisoned by his brother and war leader Awitzotl who became the next Tlatoani. Tizoc is mostly known as the namesake of the Stone of Tizoc a monumental sculpture, decorated with representation of Tizoc's conquests. The next ruler was Awitzotl, brother of Axayacatl and Tizoc and war leader under Tizoc. His successful coronation campaign suppressed rebellions in the Toluca Valley and conquered Jilatepec and several communities in the northern valley of Mexico. A second campaign to the Gulf Coast was also highly successful. He began an enlargement of the Great Temple of Tenochtitlan, inaugurating the new temple in 1487. For the inauguration ceremony the Mexica invited the rulers of all their subject cities, who participated as spectators in the ceremony in which an unprecedented number of war captives were sacrificed some sources giving a figure of 84,000 prisoners sacrificed over four days. Probably the actual figure of sacrifices was much smaller, but still numbering several thousands. Awitzotl also constructed monumental architecture in sites such as Calixtlahuaca, Malinalco, and Tepoztlan. After a rebellion in the towns of Aloistlan and Aztotikpac in northern Guerrero he ordered the entire population executed, and repopulated with people from the Valley of Mexico. He also constructed a fortified garrison at Ostuma defending the border against the Tarascan state. At the death of Awitzotl the reign passed to his war leader Motikutsomakoko Yatsen, a son of Axayacatl. His successful coronation campaign attacked the fortified city of Nopalan in Oaxaca and subjected the adjacent region to the empire. An effective warrior, Motikutsoma II maintained the pace of conquest set by his predecessor and subjected large areas in Guerrero, Oaxaca, Puebla, and even far south along the Pacific and Gulf coasts, conquering the province of Coconaco and Chiapas. He also intensified the flower wars waged against Tlaxcalan and Huxotzinco, and secured an alliance with Cholula. He also consolidated the class structure of Aztec society, by making it harder for commoners to accede to the privileged class of the Papilton through merit in combat, 
and instituted a strict sumptuary code limiting the types of luxury goods that could be consumed by commoners. Awitzotl In 1517, Moti Kutsum received the first news of ships with strange warriors having landed on the Gulf Coast near Chempa Alan and he dispatched messengers to greet them and find out what was happening, and he ordered his subjects in the area to keep him informed of any new arrivals. In 1519, he was informed of the arrival of the Spanish fleet of Hernan Cortes, who soon marched towards Tlaxcalan where he formed an alliance with the traditional enemies of the Aztecs. On November 8, 1519, Moti Kutsoma II received Cortes and his troops and Tlaxcalan allies on the causeway south of Tenochtitlan, and he invited the Spaniards to stay as his guests in Tenochtitlan. When Aztec troops destroyed a Spanish camp on the Gulf Coast, Cortes ordered Moti Kutsoma to execute the commanders responsible for the attack, and Moti Kutsoma complied. At this point the power balance had shifted towards the Spaniards who now held Moti Kutsoma as a prisoner in his own palace. As this shift in power became clear to Moti Kutsoma's subjects the Spaniards became increasingly unwelcome guests in the capital city, and in June 1520, hostilities broke out, culminating in the massacre in the Great Temple, and a major uprising of the Mexica against the Spanish. During the fighting Moti Kutsoma was killed, either by the Spaniards who killed him as they fled the city or by the Mexica themselves who considered him a traitor. Moti Kutsoma II Coco Yatsen The Spaniards fled the town on July 1, an episode later characterized as La Noche Triste, which was a major victory for the Aztecs. The Spaniards nevertheless reached Tlaxcalan where they regrouped and received reinforcements, and began to prepare a campaign of conquest in collaboration with the Tlaxcalteca. In Tenochtitlan a new Tlatoani was chosen, Moti Kutsoma's brother Quitlawak, but as an epidemic of smallpox swept through the city he died having ruled less than a year. At his death Kuaudamak son of Awitzotl was elected Tlatoani. The Spaniards and thousands of Tlaxcalteca allies returned in the spring of 1521 to lay siege to Tenochtitlan, beginning by conquering the Altapetl on the lake bank, cutting off communications and provisions to the island. They then besieged the island of Tenochtitlan from the land side, also attacking from the lakeside with ships built for the purpose. The battle ended on August 13 with the destruction of the city, and the imprisonment of Kuaudamak, who was later executed along with the rulers of Tlacopan and Texcoco. After the fall of Tenochtitlan, Aztec warriors were enlisted as auxiliary troops alongside the Spanish Tlaxcalteca allies, and Aztec forces participated in all of the subsequent campaigns of conquest in northern and southern Mesoamerica. This meant that aspects of Aztec culture and the Nahuatl language continued to expand during the early colonial period as Aztec auxiliary forces made permanent settlements in many of the areas that were put under the Spanish crown. During the colonial period the Aztec ruling dynasty continued to govern the Indian Republic of Tenochtitlan, but the subsequent rulers were mostly puppets installed by the Spanish, such as Andres de Tapia Motelchia, installed by the Spanish. Other Aztec city-states likewise came to be governed as Indian republics with a local indigenous gobernator in charge of the political organization of the Indians and of providing the Spanish landowners with tribute and corvi labor. Some indigenous governors became quite rich and influential and were able to maintain positions of power comparable to that of Spanish encomenderos. After the arrival of the Europeans in Mexico and the conquest, indigenous populations declined significantly. 
This was largely the result of the epidemics of viruses brought to the continent against which the natives had no immunity. In 1520-1521, an outbreak of smallpox swept through the population of Tenochtitlan and was decisive in the fall of the city, further significant epidemics strush in 1545 and 1576. Spanish Conquest Colonial Period Population Decline Political and Social Organization Nobles and Commoners There has been no general consensus about the population size of Mexico at the time of European arrival. Early estimates gave very small population figures for the Valley of Mexico. In 1942 Kubler estimated a figure 200,000. In 1963 Bora and Cook used pre-conquest tribute lists to calculate the number of tributaries in central Mexico, estimating over 18 to 30 million. Their very high figure has been highly criticized for relying on unwarranted assumptions. Archaeologist William Sanders based an estimate on archaeological evidence of dwellings, arriving at an estimate of 1 to 1.2 million inhabitants in the Valley of Mexico. Whitmore used a computer simulation model based on colonial censuses to arrive at an estimate of 1.5 million for the basin in 1519, and an estimate of 16 million for all of Mexico. Depending on the estimations of the population in 1519 the scale of the decline in the 16th century, range from around 50% to around 90%, with Sanders and Whitmore's estimates being around 90%. The highest class were the Pileton or nobility. The Pili status was hereditary and ascribed certain privileges to its holder such as the right to wear particularly fine garments and consume luxury goods, as well as to own land and direct corvée labor by commoners. The most powerful nobles were called lords and they owned and controlled noble estates or houses, and could serve in the highest government positions or as military leaders. Nobles made up about 5% of the population. The second class were the Mshulten, originally peasants, but later extended to the lower working classes in general. Eduardo Naguera estimates that in later stages only 20% of the population was dedicated to agriculture and food production. The other 80% of society were warriors, artisans, and traders. Eventually, most of them Sholas were dedicated to arts and crafts. Their works were an important source of income for the city. Mace Holton could become enslaved, for example if they had to sell themselves into the service of a noble due to debt or poverty, but enslavement was not an inherited status among the Aztecs. Some Mace Holton were landless and worked directly for a lord whereas the majority of commoners were organized into Kalpalis which gave them access to land and property. Commoners were able to obtain privileges similar to those of the nobles by demonstrating prowess in warfare. When a warrior took a captive he accrued the right to use certain emblems, weapons, or garments, and as he took more captives his rank and prestige increased. The Aztec family pattern was bilateral, counting relatives on the father's and mother's side of the family equally, and inheritance was also passed both to sons and daughters. This meant that women could own property just as men, and that women therefore had a good deal of economic freedom from their spouses. Nevertheless, Aztec society was highly gendered with separate gender roles for men and women. Men were expected to work outside of the house, as farmers, traders, craftsmen, and warriors, whereas women were expected to take the responsibility of the domestic sphere. Women could however also work outside of the home as small-scale merchants, doctors, priests, and midwives. 
Warfare was highly valued and a source of high prestige, but women's work was metaphorically conceived of as equivalent to warfare, and as equally important in maintaining the equilibrium of the world and pleasing the gods. This situation has led some scholars to describe Aztec gender ideology as an ideology not of a gender hierarchy, but of gender complementarity, with gender roles being separate but equal. Among the nobles, marriage alliances were often used as a political strategy with lesser nobles marrying daughters from more prestigious lineages whose status was then inherited by their children. Nobles were also often polygamous, with lords having many wives. Polygamy was not very common among the commoners and some sources describe it as being prohibited. The main unit of Aztec political organization was the city-state, in Nahuatl called the Altapetl, meaning water mountain. Each Altapetl was led by a ruler, a Tlatoani with authority over a group of nobles and a population of commoners. The Altapetl included a capital which served as a religious center, the hub of distribution and organization of a local population which often lived spread out in minor settlements surrounding the capital. Altapetl were also the main source of ethnic identity for the inhabitants, even though Altapetl were frequently composed of groups speaking different languages. Each Altapetl would see itself as standing in a political contrast to other Altapetl states, and war was waged between Altapetl states. In this way Nahuatl-speaking Aztecs of one Altapetl would be solidary with speakers of other languages belonging to the same Altapetl but enemies of Nahuatl speakers belonging to other competing Altapetl states. In the Valley of Mexico Altapetl was composed of subdivisions called Calpali, which served as the main organizational unit for commoners. In Tlaxcala and the Puebla Valley, the Altapetl was organized into Tukali units headed by a lord, who would hold sway over a territory and distribute rights to land among the commoners. A Calpali was at once a territorial unit where commoners organized labor and land use, since land was not in private property, and also often a kinship unit as a network of families that were related through intermarriage. Calpali leaders might be or become members of the nobility, in which case they could represent their Calpali's interests in the Altapetl government. Family and Gender in the Valley of Morelos, Michael E. Smith estimates that a typical Altapetl had from 10,000 to 15,000 inhabitants, and covered an area between 70 and 100 square kilometers. In the Morelos Valley Altapetl sizes were somewhat smaller. Smith argues that the Altapetl was primarily a political unit, made up of the population with allegiance to a lord rather than as a territorial unit. He makes this distinction because in some areas minor settlements with different Altapetl allegiances were interspersed. The Aztec Empire was ruled by indirect means. Like most European empires, it was ethnically very diverse, but unlike most European empires, it was more of a system of tribute than a single system of government. In the theoretical framework of imperial systems posited by Alexander J. Modell, the Aztec Empire was an informal or hegemonic empire because it did not exert supreme authority over the conquered lands, it merely expected tributes to be paid. It was also a discontinuous empire because not all dominated territories were connected, for example, the southern peripheral zones of Coconaco were not in direct contact with the center. The hegemonic nature of the Aztec Empire can be seen in the fact that generally local rulers were restored to their positions once their city-state was conquered, and the Aztecs did not interfere in local affairs as long as the tribute payments were made. Although the form of government is often referred to as an empire, in fact most areas within the empire were organized as city-states, 
known as Altapetlan Nawatl. These were small polities ruled by a king from a legitimate dynasty. The early Aztec period was a time of growth and competition among Altapetl. Even after the empire was formed in 1428 and began its program of expansion through conquest, the Altapetl remained the dominant form of organization at the local level. The efficient role of the Altapetl as a regional political unit was largely responsible for the success of the empire's hegemonic form of control. Altapetl and Kalpali Empire Economy As all Mesoamerican peoples Aztec society was organized around maize agriculture. The humid environment in the Valley of Mexico with its many lakes and swamps permitted intensive agriculture. The main crops in addition to maize were beans, squashes, chilies and amaranth. Particularly important for agricultural production in the valley was the construction of chinampas on the lake, artificial islands that allowed the conversion of the shallow waters into highly fertile gardens that could be cultivated year-round. Chinampas are areas of raised land, created from alternating layers of mud from the bottom of the lake, and plant matter slash other vegetation. These raised beds were separated by narrow canals, which allowed farmers to move between them by canoe. The chinampas were extremely fertile pieces of land, and yielded, on average, seven crops annually. On the basis of current chinampa yields, it has been estimated that one hectare of chinampa would feed 20 individuals and 9,000 hectares of chinampas could feed 180,000. The Aztecs further intensified agricultural production by constructing systems of artificial irrigation. While most of the farming occurred outside the densely populated areas, within the cities there was another method of farming. Each family had their own garden plot where they grew maize, fruits, herbs, medicines, and other important plants. When the city of Tenochtitlan became a major urban center, Water was supplied to the city through aqueducts from springs on the banks of the lake, and they organized a system that collected human waste for use as fertilizer. Through intensive agriculture the Aztecs were able to sustain a large urbanized population. The lake was also a rich source of proteins in the form of aquatic animals such as fish, amphibians, shrimp, insects, and insect eggs, and water fowl. The presence of such varied sources of protein meant that there was little use for domestic animals for meat, and scholars have calculated that there was no shortage of protein among the inhabitants of the Valley of Mexico. The excess supply of food products allowed a significant portion of the Aztec population to dedicate themselves to trades other than food production. Apart from taking care of domestic food production women weaved textiles from agave fibers and cotton. Men also engaged in craft specializations such as the production of ceramics and of obsidian and flint tools, and of luxury goods such as beadwork, feather work, and the elaboration of tools and musical instruments. Sometimes entire Kalpalis specialized in a single craft and in some archaeological sites large neighborhoods have been found where apparently only a single craft speciality was practiced. The Aztecs did not produce much metal work, but did have knowledge of basic smelting technology for gold, and they combined gold with precious stones such as jade and turquoise. Copper products were generally imported from the Tarascans of Michoacan. Products were distributed through a network of markets, some markets specialized in a single commodity and other general markets with presence of many different goods. Markets were highly organized with a system of supervisors taking care that only authorized merchants were permitted to sell their goods, and punishing those who cheated their customers or sold substandard or counterfeit goods. A typical town would have a weekly market 
while larger cities held markets every day. Cortes reported that the central market of Tlatlalco, Tenochtitlan's sister city, was visited by 60,000 people daily. Some sellers in the markets were petty vendors, farmers might sell some of their produce, potters sold their vessels, and so on. Other vendors were professional merchants who traveled from market to market seeking profits. Agriculture and Subsistence The Pochteca were specialized long-distance merchants organized into exclusive guilds. They made long expeditions to all parts of Mesoamerica bringing back exotic luxury goods, and they served as the judges and supervisors of the Tlatlalco market. Although the economy of Aztec Mexico was commercialized land and labor were not commodities for sale. In the commercial sector of the economy several types of money were in regular use. Small purchases were made with cacao beans, which had to be imported from lowland areas. In Aztec marketplaces, a small rabbit was worth 30 beans, a turkey egg cost 3 beans, and a tamal cost a single bean. For larger purchases, Standardized lengths of cotton cloth called quaktli were used. There were different grades of quaktli, ranging in value from 65 to 300 cacao beans. One source stated that 20 quaktli could support a commoner for one year in Tenochtitlan. A small gold statue approximately 0.62 kilograms cost 250 beans. Another form of distribution of goods was through the payment of tribute. When an altipetl was conquered the victor imposed a yearly tribute, usually paid in the form of whichever local product was most valuable or treasured. Several pages from the Codex Mendoza list tributary towns along with the goods they supplied, which included not only luxuries such as feathers, adorned suits and green stone beads, but more practical goods such as cloth, firewood, and food. Tribute was usually paid twice or four times a year at differing times. Archaeological excavations in the Aztec-ruled provinces show that incorporation into the empire had both costs and benefits for provincial peoples. On the positive side, the empire promoted commerce and trade, and exotic goods from obsidian to bronze managed to reach the houses of both commoners and nobles. Trade partners also included the enemy Pur Pasha, a source of bronze tools and jewelry. On the negative side, imperial tribute imposed a burden on commoner households, who had to increase their work to pay their share of tribute. Nobles, on the other hand, often made out well under imperial rule because of the indirect nature of imperial organization. The empire had to rely on local kings and nobles and offered them privileges for their help in maintaining order and keeping the tribute flowing. Aztec society combined a relatively simple agrarian rural tradition with the development of truly urbanized society with a complex system of institutions, specializations, and hierarchies. The urban tradition in Mesoamerica was developed during the Classic period with major urban centers such as Teotihuacan with a population well above 100,000 and at the rise of the Aztec the urban tradition was ingrained in Mesoamerican society, with urban centers serving major religious, political and economic functions for the entire population. The capital city of the Aztec Empire was Tenochtitlan, now the site of modern-day Mexico City. Built on a series of islets in Lake Texcoco, the city plan was based on a symmetrical layout that was divided into four city sections called Campan. Tenochtitlan was built according to a fixed plan and centered on the ritual precinct, where the Great Pyramid of Tenochtitlan rose 50 m above the city. Houses were made of wood and loam, roofs were made of reed, although pyramids, temples and palaces were generally made of stone. 
The city was interlaced with canals, which were useful for transportation. Anthropologist Eduardo Naguera estimates the population at 200,000 based in the house count and merging the population of Tlatlalco. If one includes the surrounding islets and shores surrounding Lake Texcoco, estimates range from 300,000 to 700,000 inhabitants. Michael E. Smith gives a somewhat smaller figure of 212,500 inhabitants of Tenochtitlan based on an area of 1,350 hectares and a population density of 157. The second largest city in the Valley of Mexico in the Aztec period was Texcoco with some 25,000 inhabitants dispersed over 450 hectares. The center of Tenochtitlan was the sacred precinct, a walled-off square area which housed the Great Temple, temples for other deities, the Ball Court, the Kalmakak, a skull rack Sampantli, displaying the skulls of sacrificial victims, houses of the warrior orders, a penitential palace of the Tlatoani and a merchant's palace. Around the sacred precinct were the royal palaces of the rulers. The centerpiece of Tenochtitlan was the Templo Mayor, the Great Temple, a large stepped pyramid with a double staircase leading up to two twin shrines one dedicated to Tlaloc, the other to Hutzilopochtli. This was where most of the human sacrifices were carried out during the ritual festivals and the bodies of sacrificial victims were thrown down the stairs. The temple was enlarged in several stages and most of the Aztec rulers made a point of adding a further stage, each with a new dedication and inauguration. The temple has been excavated in the center of Mexico City and the rich dedicatory offerings are displayed in the Museum of the Templo Mayor. Archaeologist Eduardo Matos Moctezuma, in his essay Symbolism of the Templo Mayor, posits that the orientation of the temple is indicative of the totality of the vision the Mexica had of the universe. He states that the principal center, or navel, where the horizontal and vertical planes intersect, that is, the point from which the heavenly or upper plane and the plane of the underworld begin and the four directions of the universe originate, is the Templo Mayor of Tenochtitlan. Matos Moctezuma supports his supposition by claiming that the temple acts as an embodiment of a living myth where all sacred power is concentrated and where all the levels intersect. Other major Aztec cities were some of the previous city-state centers around the lake including Tinayuca, Ajke Potzalco, Texcoco, Calhuacan, Tlacapan, Chapultepec, Coyoacan, Xochimilco, and Chalco. In the Puebla Valley Cholula was the largest city with the largest pyramid temple in Mesoamerica, while the Confederacy of Tlaxcala consisted of four smaller cities. In Morelos, Cuauhnahuac was a major city of the Nahuatl-speaking Tlawica tribe, and Tolucan in the Toluca Valley was the capital of the Matlatzinxa tribe which included Nahuatl speakers as well as speakers of Otomi and the language today called Matlatzinxa. Most Aztec cities had a similar layout with a central plaza with a major pyramid with two staircases and a double temple oriented towards the west. Aztec religion was organized around the practice of calendar rituals dedicated to a pantheon of different deities. Similar to other Mesoamerican religious systems it has generally been understood as a polytheist agriculturalist religion with elements of animism. Central in the religious practice was the offering of sacrifices to the deities, as a way of thanking or paying for the continuation of the cycle of life. Crafts and Trades Trade and Distribution The main deities worshipped by the Aztecs were Tlaloc, a rain and storm deity, Hutzilopochtli a solar and martial deity and the tutelary deity of the Mexica tribe, Quetzalcoatl, a wind, sky, and star deity and cultural hero, Tezcatlipoca, a deity of the night, 
Magic, Prophecy and Fate The Great Temple in Tenochtitlan had two shrines on its top, one dedicated to Tlaloc, the other to Hutzilopochtli. Quetzalcoatl and Tezcatlipoca each had separate temples within the religious precinct close to the Great Temple, and the high priests of the Great Temple were named Quetzalcoatl Tlamacazcu. Other major deities were Tlaltecutli or Kotlaku, a female earth deity, the deity couple Tonakatekutli and Tonakasiwatl were associated with life and sustenance, Mitlantekutli and Mitlansiwatl, a male slash female couple of deities of the underworld and death, Chalchiatlaku, a female deity of lakes and springs, Zyptotek, a deity of fertility and the natural cycle, Huadiatl, or Zyuchikutli, a fire god, Tlazaltaatl, a female deity tied to childbirth and sexuality, and a Kochapali and Kochaketsal gods of song, dance, and games. In some regions, particularly Tlaxcala, Mixcoatl, or Kamaxtli was the main tribal deity. A few sources mention a deity Omediatl who may have been a god of the duality between life and death, male and female and who may have incorporated Tonakatekatli and Tonakasiwatl. Apart from the major deities there were dozens of minor deities each associated with an element or concept, and as the Aztec Empire grew so did their pantheon because they adopted and incorporated the local deities of conquered people into their own. Additionally the major gods had many alternative manifestations or aspects, creating small families of gods with related aspects. Aztec mythology is known from a number of sources written down in the colonial period. One set of myths, called Legend of the Suns, describe the creation of four successive suns, or periods, each ruled by a different deity and inhabited by a different group of beings. Each period ends in a cataclysmic destruction that sets the stage for the next period to begin. In this process, the deities Tezcatlipoca and Quetzalcoatl appear as adversaries, each destroying the creations of the other. The current sun, the fifth was created when a minor deity sacrificed himself on a bonfire and turned into the sun, but the sun only begins to move once the other deities sacrifice themselves and offers it their life force. Tribute In another myth of how the earth was created Tezcatlipoca and Quetzalcoatl appear as allies, defeating a giant crocodile Sipactli and requiring her to become the earth allowing humans to carve into her flesh and plant their seeds, on the condition that in return they will offer blood to her. And in the story of the creation of humanity Quetzalcoatl travels with his twin Colatl to the underworld and brings back bones which are then ground like corn on a matate by the goddess Siwakotl, the resulting dough is given human form and comes to life when Quetzalcoatl imbues it with his own blood. Urbanism Tenochtitlan The Great Temple Other Cities Religion Deities Mythology and Cosmovision Calendar Human Sacrifice Art and Cultural Production Writing and Iconography Music, song, and poetry. Visual and plastic art. Legacy. Hutzilopochtli is the deity tied to the Mexica tribe and he figures in the story of the origin and migrations of the tribe. On their journey, Hutzilopochtli, in the form of a deity bundle carried by the Mexica priest, continuously spurs the tribe on by pushing them into conflict with their neighbors whenever they are settled in a place. In another myth Hutzilopochtli defeats and dismembers his sister the lunar deity Koyalzaurki and her four hundred brothers at the hill of Kotpital. The southern side of the great temple, also called Kotpital, 
was a representation of this myth and at the foot of the stairs lay a large stone monolith carved with a representation of the dismembered goddess. Aztec religious life was organized around the calendars. As most Mesoamerican people, the Aztecs used two calendars simultaneously, a ritual calendar of 260 days called the Tonalpahuali and a solar calendar of 365 days called the Zayapahuali. Each day had a name and number in both calendars, and the combination of two dates were unique within a period of 52 years. The Tonalpahuali was mostly used for divinatory purposes and it consisted of 20-day signs and number coefficients of 113 that cycled in a fixed order. The Zihapahuali was made up of 18 months of 20 days, and with a remainder of 5 void days at the end of a cycle before the new Zihapahuali cycle began. Each 20-day month was named after the specific ritual festival that began the month many of which contained a relation to the agricultural cycle. Whether, and how, the Aztec calendar corrected for leap year is a matter of discussion among specialists. The monthly rituals involved the entire population as rituals were performed in each household, in the Kalpali temples and in the main sacred precinct. Many festivals involved different forms of dancing, as well as the reenactment of mythical narratives by deity impersonators and the offering of sacrifice, in the form of food, animals, and human victims. Every 52 years the two calendars reached their shared starting point and a new calendar cycle began. This calendar event was celebrated with a ritual known as Zyomolpali or the New Fire Ceremony. In this ceremony old pottery was broken in all homes and all fires in the Aztec realm were put out. Then a new fire was drilled over the breast of a sacrificial victim and runners brought the new fire to the different Kalpali communities where fire was redistributed to each home. The night without fire was associated with the fear that star demons, Tsitsimim, might descend and devour the earth ending the fifth period of the sun. To the Aztecs, death was instrumental in the perpetuation of creation, and gods and humans alike had the responsibility of sacrificing themselves in order to allow life to continue. As described in the myth of creation above, humans were understood as responsible for the sun's continued revival, as well as for the paying the earth for its continued fertility. Blood sacrifice in various forms were conducted. Both humans and animals were sacrificed, depending on the god to be placated and the ceremony being conducted, and priests of some gods were sometimes required to provide their own blood through self-mutilation. It is known that some rituals included acts of cannibalism, with the captor and his family consuming part of the flesh of their sacrificed captives, but it is not known how widespread this practice was. While human sacrifice was practiced throughout Mesoamerica, the Aztecs, if their own accounts are to be believed, brought this practice to an unprecedented level. For example, for the reconsecration of the Great Pyramid of Tenochtitlan in 1487, the Aztecs reported that they sacrificed 80,400 prisoners over the course of four days reportedly by Ahuitzotl, the great speaker himself. This number, however, is not universally accepted. The scale of Aztec human sacrifice has provoked many scholars to consider what may have been the driving factor behind this aspect of Aztec religion. In the 1970s, Michael Harner and Marvin Harris argued that the motivation behind human sacrifice among the Aztecs was actually the cannibalization of the sacrificial victims. Harner claimed that very high population pressure and an emphasis on maize agriculture, without domesticated herbivores, led to a deficiency of essential amino acids amongst the Aztecs. 
While there is universal agreement that the Aztecs practiced sacrifice, there is a lack of scholarly consensus as to whether cannibalism was widespread. Harris, author of Cannibals and Kings, has propagated the claim, originally proposed by Harner, that the flesh of the victims was a part of an aristocratic diet as a reward, since the Aztec diet was lacking in proteins. These claims have been refuted by Bernard Ortiz Montalano who, in his studies of Aztec health, diet, and medicine, demonstrates that while the Aztec diet was low in animal proteins, it was rich in vegetable proteins. Ortiz also points to the preponderance of human sacrifice during periods of food abundance following harvests compared to periods of food scarcity, the insignificant quantity of human protein available from sacrifices and the fact that aristocrats already had easy access to animal protein. Today many scholars point to ideological explanations of the practice, noting how the public spectacle of sacrificing warriors from conquered states was a major display of political power, supporting the claim of the ruling classes to divine authority. It also served as an important deterrent against rebellion by subjugated polities against the Aztec state and such deterrents were crucial in order for the loosely organized empire to cohere. The Aztecs did not have a fully developed writing system like the Maya did, but like the Maya and Zapotec they did use a writing system that combined logographic signs with phonetic syllable signs. Logograms would for example be the use of an image of a mountain to signify the word Tepetl Mountain, whereas a phonetic syllable sign would be the use of an image of a tooth fluently to signify the syllable TLA in words unrelated to teeth. The combination of these principles allowed the Aztecs to represent the sounds of names of persons and places. Narratives tended to be represented through sequences of images, using different iconographic conventions such as footprints to show paths, temples on fire to show conquest events etc. Epigrapher Alfonso La Cadena has demonstrated that the different syllable signs used by the Aztecs almost enabled the representation of all the most frequent syllables of the Nahuatl language, but some scholars have argued that such a high degree of phoneticity was only achieved after the conquest when the Aztecs had been introduced to the principles of phonetic writing by the Spanish. Other scholars, notably Gordon Whitaker, have argued that the syllabic and phonetic aspects of Aztec writing were considerably less systematic and more creative than La Cadena's proposal suggests, arguing that Aztec writing never coalesced into a strictly syllabic system such as the Maya writing, but rather used a wide range of different types of phonetic signs. The image to write demonstrates the use of phonetic signs for writing place names in a colonial Aztec codex. The uppermost place is Mapectepec, meaning literally Raccoon Mountain, but the glyph includes the phonetic signs Ma and Patch over a mountain tepetl spelling the word Mapec phonetically instead of logographically. The other two place names Mazatlan and Hutzlan use the phonetic element TLAN represented by a tooth combined with a deer head to spell Maza and a thorn to spell Hutz. Song and poetry were highly regarded, there were presentations and poetry contests at most of the Aztec festivals. There were also dramatic presentations that included players, musicians, and acrobats. There were several different genres of Quicatl. Yeo Quicatl was devoted to war and the god of war, Tia Quicatl to the gods and creation myths and to adoration of said figures, Cocha Quicatl to flowers. Prose was Tlatelai, also with its different categories and divisions. A key aspect of Aztec poetics was the use of parallelism using a structure of embedded couplets to express different perspectives on the same element. Some such couplets were diphrasisms, 
conventional metaphors whereby an abstract concept was expressed metaphorically by using two more concrete concepts. For example, the Nahuatl expression for poetry was in Hochitl and Quicatl a dual term meaning the flower, the song, and the term for visual arts was in Tlili and Tlapali the black ink, the red paint. A remarkable amount of this poetry survives, having been collected during the era of the conquest. In some cases poetry is attributed to individual authors, such as Nezahualcoyotl, Tlatoani of Texcoco, and Cuacuahutzin, Lord of Tepecpan, but whether these attributions reflect actual authorship is a matter of opinion. The most important collection of these poems is Romances de los Señores de la Nueva España, collected, probably by Juan Bautista de Pomar. Bautista de Pomar was the great-grandson of Netzahualcoyotl. He spoke Nahuatl, but was raised a Christian and wrote in Latin characters. Aztec visual art was produced on animal skin, on cotton lienzos and on amati paper made from bark, it was also produced on ceramics and carved in wood and stone. The surface of the material was often first treated with gesso to make the images stand out more clearly. For ceramics most designs were produced in black ink on the background of an orange slip, this black on orange ware being characteristic of the Aztec period. In the Nahua treatise on art in the Florentine Codex, the venerated painters describe the colors, how they were obtained from nature, how they were produced, and how people painted with them. According to Magalani Kerpel in The Colors of the New World, the treatise organizes colors according to a system of complementary polarities. The colors are divided into the organic and mineral. Furthermore, saturated and vibrant colors contrasted opaque and dark colors. There was also a distinction between primary and secondary colors. Each color had a specific significance based on their raw material and their natural state. Black ink was largely used to outline colored images. Rather than mixing colors, artists would often layer them in order to make them more intense. Lastly, most of the colorants and pigments used in the Florentine Codex were of Mesoamerican origin, however, the only European paint pigment found in the Codex is Minium. Minium was so often used in European medieval illuminated manuscripts that those paintings were called miniatures from Minure in Latin, which means to color with red. In the Florentine Codex, Minium's use was specific, it was used on images that describe or indicate the colonial, Spanish present as a new era of Aztec history. Minimum represented the present as it was dominated by Spaniards who had won the colonial war, while Nocestli represented the primitive, indigenous past of New Spain. Thus, the contrast between the saturated and diluted colors were utilized to indicate two temporalities in Mesoamerican history. Sculptures were carved in stone and wood, but few wood carvings have survived. Aztec stone sculptures exist in many sizes from small figurines to large monuments, and are characterized by a high quality of work. Ceramics was also used for large sculptures, and decorative vessels. Most modern-day Mexicans are mestizos, of mixed indigenous and European ancestry. During the 16th century the racial composition of Mexico began to change from one that featured distinct indigenous and immigrant populations, to the population composed primarily of mestizos that is found in modern-day Mexico. The Nahuatl language is today spoken by 1.5 million people, mostly in mountainous areas in the states of central Mexico. Local dialects of Spanish Mexican Spanish generally, and the Spanish language worldwide have all been influenced, in varying degrees, by Nahuatl.
Some Nahuatl words have been borrowed through Spanish into other languages around the world. Mexico City was built on the ruins of Tenochtitlan, making it one of the oldest living cities of the Americas. Many of its districts and natural landmarks retain their original Nahuatl names. Many other cities and towns in Mexico and Central America have also retained their Nahuatl names. A number of town names are hybrids of Nahuatl and Spanish. Mexican cuisine continues to be based on and flavored by agricultural products contributed by the Mexicas-Aztecs and Mesoamerica, most of which retain some form of their original Nahuatl names. The cuisine has also become a popular part of the cuisine of the United States and other countries around the world, typically altered to suit various national tastes. The modern Mexican flag bears the emblem of the Mexica migration story. Before the development of archaeology in Mexico in the 19th century, Historians mainly interpreted the records of the Spanish conquerors and the accounts of early European travelers and antiquaries who investigated the enigmatic monuments the Indians left to posterity. It was not until the 19th century that the work of men such as John Lloyd Stevens, Edward Seeler, and Alfred P. Maudslay, and of institutions such as the Peabody Museum of Harvard University, led to a better appreciation of the evidence available. Subsequently, there emerged indigenous Mexican archaeologists of international caliber. Archaeology allowed the reconsideration and criticism of some of those interpretations and contradictions between the primary sources. Now, the scholarly study of Aztec civilization is most often based on scientific and multidisciplinary methodologies. There are few extant Aztec codices created before the conquest and these are largely ritual texts. Post-conquest codices, like Codex Mendoza or Codex Rios, were painted by Aztec Tlaxulos, but under the control of Spanish authorities. The possibility of Spanish influence poses potential problems for those studying the post-conquest codices. Izacotl had the oldest hieroglyphics destroyed for political religious reasons and Bishop Zumaraga of Mexico had all available texts burned for missionary reasons. The accounts of the conquistadors are those of men confronted with a new civilization, which they tried to interpret according to their own culture. Cortés was the most educated, and his letters to Charles V are a valuable first-hand account. Unfortunately, one of his letters is lost and replaced by a posterior text and the others were censored prior to their publication. In any case, Cortés was not writing a dispassionate account, but letters justifying his actions and to some extent exaggerating his successes and downplaying his failures. Bernal Díaz del Castillo accompanied Cortés, and he later wrote a book named the Discovery and Conquest of Mexico. In his book, Capitan Bernal Díaz del Castillo provides his account of the conquest of Mexico, in which he describes the events leading up to the conquest of Mexico, including accounts of the human sacrifices and cannibalism that he witnessed firsthand. However, Bernal Díaz wrote several decades after the fact, never learned the native languages, and did not take notes. His account is colorful, but his work is considered by historians to be erratic and exaggerated. Although Francisco López de Gamara was Cortés' chaplain, friend, and confidant, he never visited the New World so his account is based on hearsay. The accounts of the first priests and scholars, while reflecting their faith and their culture, are important sources. Fathers Diego Duran, Motolinia, and Mendieta wrote with their own religion in mind, Father Duran wrote trying to prove that the Aztec were one of the lost tribes of Israel. Bartolomé de las Casas wrote apologetically about the Indians, 
accusing the Spanish conquistadors of committing unspeakable atrocities in their subjugation of the Aztecs and other indigenous groups. Some authors tried to make a synthesis of the pre-Hispanic cultures, like Oviedo y Herrera, José de Acosta, and Pedro Martyr de Angira. The most significant source about the Aztec are doubtless the manuscripts of Bernardino de Sehagan, who worked with Christian Aztec youths from Texcoco, Ajk Potzalco, and Tlatlalco who studying at the Colegio de Santa Cruz de Tlatlalco. With his assistance he interviewed Aztec elders who had knowledge of the pre-Hispanic customs and recorded it in a bilingual 12-volume codex written in parallel Nahuatl and Sapanish columns. The work is now known as the Florentine Codex. Other important sources are the work of native and mestizo authors, descendants of the upper classes. These authors include Don Fernando Alvarado Tizazamuk, Kimal Pahin Coahutl Huanit Sin, Juan Bautista de Pomar, and Fernando de Alva Cortez Islixocatl. Islixocatl, for example, wrote a history of Texcoco from a Christian point of view. His account of Netzawalcoyotl, an ancestor of Islilxocatl's, has a strong resemblance to the story of King Solomon and portrays Netzawalcoyotl as a monotheist and a critic of human sacrifice. Diego Munoz Camargo, a Tlaxcalan mestizo, wrote the history of Tlaxcala six decades after the Spanish conquest. Some parts of his work have a strong Tlaxcala bias. Historiography Aztec Codices The Conquistadors Priests and Scholars Native Authors Notes Footnotes